So, um, so we started two weeks ago a sermon series called The Modern Day Priesthood. And two weeks ago, I preached on biblical priesthood. And there was four biblical priesthoods we looked at in the Bible. Uh, the first one was the heavenly priesthood of Melchizedek, without father, mother, beginning or ending, who came down, touched Abram, blessed Abram before Abram became Abraham, the father of our faith. Then we went and looked at the Levitical priesthood, which is a copy or a shadow of what the priesthood should look like. God's original intention was that all of Israel would be priests to the rest of the nations. But because they couldn't ascend up to that level, what God did is made the Levites a tribe of priests to the rest of the tribes. And I think that's important because we still have that struggle today in America, in our American church, and that we still have clergy who are supposed to do the work of the ministry and the congregants that don't. But that is a, that's a false shadow of what God intended. What God intended was that every believer would be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of us are called a ministry. Then we fast forward and we looked at the book of Revelation and we saw the eternal priesthood. We see that in the book of Revelation, there are kings and priests in the heavenlies eternally. And this is the thing I think is very important. If this is a, the priesthood is a God idea. Man did not come up with this idea. God did. And if God had a heavenly priesthood before mankind came, and then God also, as we look in the book of Revelations, there is an eternal priesthood. That tells me that the priesthood never goes out of date. It's very important. God created it. And then the fourth part is we looked in 1 Peter where he says that we are the royal priesthood, that we, the church today, are in the game, on the field, we're the royal priesthood. Well, if we're the priests of God, and it's a God idea, it's never going to go out of vogue, it's never going to go out of style, we're never going to get to a place where we don't need priests anymore, and we are the royal priests in the game, on the field, maybe we should figure out what a modern day priest looks like. So that was two weeks ago. Last week then we talked about the consecration of the priest. And we talked about that Aaron and his sons, when they uh, started the Levitical priesthood, that they would take the blood of a ram and they would place it on the right earlobe, the right thumb, and the right toe of the priest. They would consecrate them. And we talked about that the right side is considered a side of power and that our strengths have to be consecrated before the Lord. Most Christians are worried about their weaknesses where God's more concerned about your strengths. He knows that, you're, that you will lean on your strengths and not submit them to the Lord. We, we know our weaknesses are frail. So we'll bring them in. We don't trust our weaknesses at all. The problem is we do trust our strengths. And God says your weaknesses nor your strengths are good enough. They need to be consecrated to me. And we talked about the consecrated the, the ear so that they could hear the Lord, their hand, the seat of productivity, and their feet, which would anoint their path. And then we tapped into... Job chapter 42 about intercession. We began that conversation because I believe the, the job of the priest is to represent God to the people and represent the people back to God. And intercession at its core is to get between two parties for the sake of reconciliation. So intercession, when I mention intercession, a lot of times people think I'm talking about prayer. Prayer is a form of intercession, but it is not intercession. The greatest act of intercession of all time is when Jesus died on the cross and, and reconciled God and man together. That was not a pretty little prayer. That was an act of sacrifice, but it was the greatest act of intercession of all time. He got between man and God and then reconciled us back together. So, and I firmly believe that intercession is one of the sweetest gifts that you can give the Lord. When the Lord blesses you and you choose to not use it all on yourself, but to share it with somebody else, it's one of the sweetest gifts you can give the Lord. And we talked about chapter 42 of Job. And if you'll remember, it's the very end of the story. And Job's sitting there with his three friends. And God shows up and he speaks to the three friends. And he says, hey, you three guys, you did not speak well of me. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to go get some sacrifices. and You're going to offer me a sacrifice. And you're going to ask my buddy, my friend Job, to pray for you. Now, I accept Job. He's accepted by me. And if he prays for you, you will, I will not judge you according to your folly. Now, this is a really key passage of Scripture in the Bible. What we see here is God says, I've accepted Job. Job's my friend. I, I got good stuff for Job. Now, you three over there, 
The way you treated me, you deserve judgment for your folly. But I am so gracious, I put Job in your circle of influence. I made Job one of your friends. And if Job prays for you, I'm going to treat you like I would treat Job instead of treating you like what you deserve. So what happens is God will put you in a circle of friends that need somebody who's got the favor of God on their life so we can extend that favor to those who aren't even qualified or even asking for it. So today, then we're going to fast forward today and we're going to talk about the modern day priesthood. And I'm just going to warn you, I'm pushing us off the cliff this morning. Uh, we're going all the way this morning. We're going to talk. I'm going to stretch your theology this morning, and it's going to be okay. But if we're going to talk about the modern day priesthood, we have to understand this concept. And, and I'm going to, after I read this passage, I'm going to go back and tell you the journey I've been on that's got me to where we are today. I've been waiting to preach this for a year and a half. And, and today's the day. We're going all out, all in. Are you ready? All right. So, Mark, don't encourage me too much, y'all. Um, <laughs> Mark chapter 2 is, is one of these pivotal stories that's changed my life. Mark 2, 1 through 12. And it says, And again entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. By the way, what I want for our church is not that we're known for preaching, worship, hospitality, and nursery. What I want them to know is he is in that house. He is there. If you go there, you're going to meet him. Because that's all we care about is that he is in this house. Amen. Immediately, many gathered together so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, there should be some breakthroughs happening in the church. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus with themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. All right, how many of y'all have ever read this passage before? And how many of us have ever heard a sermon preached on this before? I, I've, I've personally preached this passage several times. I've heard other preachers pass, uh, preach this passage. Usually, what, there's usually one of two sermons that come out of this. The first is, you need to have good friends that are willing to go the extra length to get you what you need. You know? well, what about four guys that will climb up on the roof, tear up a man's roof off, and lower you down in the middle of the meeting. I mean, isn't it nice to have friends that have faith, that believe God is who he said he is, and willing to go to war with you? That's one of the great sermons that you can find out of that passage. But the, the sermon that normally is preached out of this passage is that Jesus healed the paralytic based on their faith. So what happens is, is that God responds to faith. So God, when he looks at you, he's looking to see... Do you have faith that he is who he said he is? He can do what he said he could do, and he wants to do it right here, right now for you. So when God is presenting himself to you, he's looking for his word of faith in you to come into agreement with all that he is and all that he can do. Now, in this passage, though, it says clearly that Jesus saw their faith. Again, this is a moment of intercession. Jesus is going to heal this man, not based on his faith, but going to be based on their faith. Did you realize that not all the faith God has given you is just for you? 
Some of the faith he's given you is for other people. Not every dollar God has given you is just for you. Some of the dollars he's given you is to give back to the house of the Lord. Some is to bless missionaries. Some is to help the poor. And some is to pay your own bills and do all that kind of stuff. But some of the grace he's given you, the experiences he's given you, the anointings and gifts he's given you are not for you. They're for other people. So here are these four men, men who are full of faith and they bring their buddy in and their buddy gets healed based on their faith. I want to be one of those buddies that walks in such a level that other people get blessed because they're in my world. Is that fair? But that's not the sermon I'm preaching today. Because there's an obvious problem with this passage right here. There is an obvious problem. I've never heard it preached before. I don't hear anybody talking about this. It's been rattling around in my spirit for a year and a half. I'm on a journey with the Lord. And today we're going to pull that out and look at that. Are you ready? Jesus forgave that man's sin and that man didn't repent or even ask him to do it. Forget about getting healed. His whole eternity just changed. Jesus looked at their faith and forgave this man's sin. Wait a minute, that doesn't work like that. I've read this Bible and I know how this works. If you want to get rid of your sin, you have to come under conviction from the Holy Spirit. You have to be repulsed with your action of sin. You have to fall on your knees before the Lord and confess your sin. You have to repent and turn from your wicked ways and hope that God's gracious to you because that's what this book talks about, right? That's not what happened. God looked at their faith because they had repented, because they had been convicted, because they had turned from their wicked ways. They had extended their faith to this man, and God treated this man as if he had done it. Whoa, now that's a level of intercession. I mean, I, I, I remember I, was, I read this passage a year and a half ago, and, and when I read the passage, I, I just couldn't even believe this was in my Bible. I couldn't even believe it. I said, Jesus forgave his sins, and he didn't even repent. He did not even repent. Wait a minute, because four other guys had already repented and they extended the grace on their life to this guy. Wow, this is crazy stuff. He didn't even ask Jesus to forgive him. I mean, he didn't even ask Jesus. Here's the thing, by the way. Many times the Lord will woo you to come to him to deal with a small area in your life that you're ready to deal with, only to find out when you show up, he's really after something bigger. You didn't mean to bring in the room with you. I, listen, listen, if he convicts you of something small, run to him and don't say, oh, that's no big deal. He don't even want to mess with you. Sometimes the Lord will say, hey, you know that little thing right there? I want to deal with that. And you're like, great, Papa, this is going to be awesome. He's like, what's in your pocket? what do you mean? He said, no, no, what's that in your, what's behind your back? I, there, there's nothing behind my back. I, I, I've seen it time and time. Here, here these guys are, they're bringing their friend to get healed so he can walk. And Jesus looks at the healing and says, I can do that. But what this guy needs is an eternal relationship with God to not live under guilt or shame. He needs to be a son of God. That's what I want to do for him. Can you imagine if we begin to walk in faith and extend that to our family and friends and see what God would do in their life just because a modern-day priest happens to be in their family or on their job or in their neighborhood? That's where we're going. So Jesus responded to the faith of the friends, and Jesus dealt with the bigger issue of sin. Now, whew, there's another thing in this passage. I mean, I look at this, and I'm like, what? Jesus just forgave him of sins. What happened immediately? Immediately, the scribes said, wait a minute. Who is this? Nobody can forgive sins except for God alone, right? Then Jesus says these words. But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, which is easier, pick up your mat and leave, right? Okay, Jesus called himself the Son of Man. You go through the scriptures, and you'll see over and over and over again that Jesus calls himself not the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man over and over and over again. Only in John 10 and 11 does he even agree that he is the Son of God. Everywhere else, he's like, I'm the Son of Man. Why? The Bible is very clear. Sin came, through the, came to the earth through one man, and through one man's sacrifice, sin was eradicated. 
a man had to come and redeem mankind. God could not come as God, use all his supernatural power, work his way around the system, and cheat the system. It can't work. So Jesus had to become a man. He was 100% God, 100% man, but here's the mystery. Jesus never walked in his own deity while he was on the earth. Jesus came and submitted his deity and walked in his humanity and did not walk in his own deity. And you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus did all these miracles, and, and, and that sure looks like God to me. Exactly. Jesus did not do one miracle until he was 30 years old, and he was baptized in the Jordan River, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him, and Jesus then borrowed the deity of the Holy Spirit to do all the miracles that he did. He was fully man and did not do miracles until the Holy Spirit came upon him. But here's what happened. As immediately when he was baptized, it says he came out of the water. His eyes were open to the Spirit. He saw the dove, and his ears were open. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He immediately, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. His spiritual eyes are open. His spiritual ears are open. So here's what happens. Any man filled with the Holy Spirit with their eyes and ears fully trained to heaven in 100% obedience, will look divine because God will work through that man and woman. So what happens is, is that either one, we don't cooperate with the Holy Spirit, our eyes and ears are not feasted on the Lord, or we're not obeying God, but when those things lined up, God moves through a willing vessel, and it looks like deity because God is doing something in that person's life. Now let me just pause here and make sure we're all saying, I am not God. Can we repeat that out loud? I am not God. I am a son of God, but I'm not God. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Okay. Where we're going, you're going to need to remember that. So Jesus, Jesus came as a man. Sin came in the world through one man, Adam. Now Jesus comes as God, but submitted to his humanity until he's 30 years old, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon him. His eyes and ears are trained on the Lord, and now he begins to walk in the deity of the Holy Spirit, and now he, he looks divine, but he's still the Son of Man. And he says in this passage, so that you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, which is easier. You're healed, your sins are forgiven, take up your mat and leave. I'm scratching my head when I'm reading this passage. And I'm sitting here going, this is pre-cross. Jesus just forgave that guy of his sins. And he's not gone to the cross yet. He's not died. He's not been resurrected. He's not sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. What is going on? How is this happening here and now? All right. So a couple years ago, this is where my journey began. A couple years ago, I began to wrestle with the Lord in prayer. He began to woo me to start spending a couple hours a day in prayer. And, and, and volume of prayer does matter. Not religious, but, but if you pray every day, there's a, there's a, the flywheel begins to take on speed. There's momentum. There's things that happen. When you prime the pump enough, suddenly you can walk in. Some of you prayer warriors in the room, you understand what I'm going to say. It, it, because you've prayed every day for the last 14 days, when you walk in to pray this morning, it takes you three seconds to find the river. It takes you three seconds to hear his voice. It, takes you, it doesn't take long at all because you're, you stay in that constant state. If you've been out of prayer for a while and you try to get in, there's some stuff you've got to work through. You've got to redig. The enemy's constantly trying to clog back up your wells. You go dig a well and you leave. You come back and there's some garbage in the well going, how'd that get in there? Because the enemy's trying to stop. That's what happened with Abraham and Isaac. They kept trying to clog up the wells. We have to dig our own wells. So a couple years ago, I began to spend a lot of time with the Lord in prayer. And it was during that time that I began to really experience the, the favor of God, the blessing of God, his delight in me, his pleasure with me. I, I was overwhelmed. I had no idea he loved me like that. That he's like, man, there ain't nothing like you in all the universe. I said, is that a, is that a good thing? He's like, yeah, I, I made you unique and special. And, and, and he and I just really had some deep, loving, intimate time with each other. And I found that in those moments, 
Papa would fill me with so much love. And see, the thing about love is it's got to be expressed. It's got to be shared. You can't tell me you, you love somebody if you never do anything nice for them. I mean, love demands that you do something. So I would be in this moment with the Lord in prayer, and my heart would be so full of love, and he would just gently put one of you on my radar. And I would suddenly just go, oh, God, they need you, God. They need a job. They need a healing. They need something. And the Lord would take that love and wouldn't let me use it all on myself. And he'd say, Nick, they're not in here praying two hours a day. You are. But I'll treat them as if they did if you'll exchange that and put that in their account. Okay, so some of this blessing you're giving me is not just for me. No, 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 Nick. It's for your assignments. It's for the people around you. You're standing here, but I will treat them like I treated Job's friend. I'll treat them like I treated Job because Job prayed for them. If you pray for them, I'll treat them like I would, just as if there was in here a couple hours a day praying. I'm like, wow. And then one day I was in here, and he said, good morning, chief repenter. I said, chief repenter. I know I've told you this story, but I, I got, you have to understand how all this came about. I said, chief repenter. He said, I want you to repent of your sins, your family's sins, the congregation's sins, and the sins of this community. I said, I don't understand. He said, look, Nick, there's people living in sin, and they don't understand how bad it's messing up their life, and they won't repent. But if you will repent for them, I can treat them as if they had repented. What? What? Are you sure? And then he began to take me in the Scripture, and he began to show me some stuff. And I began to look at the high priest. Every year, the high priest on the Day of Atonement would come in, and the first thing he would do is repent of his own sins. And then he would repent of the sins of his family, and then he would repent of the sins of the nation, and then God would accept the sacrifice and roll back the guilt for another year. Wait a minute. You mean this is in the Bible that a, a, an earthly priest who had sin in his life would simply confess his sin, the sins of his family, the sins of the nation, and God would treat the nation as if they had all repented because the high priest did and would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And, and God would, see, that's the difference between the old and new covenant. The old covenant was that once a year the priest would sprinkle the innocent blood of a lamb on the mercy seat and gave God the right to pass over judgment for another year. He would just delay court for a year. It was still there, but he would delay court for a year. Then when Jesus came, he's the perfect lamb of God. He's the perfect blood. Jesus said, okay, I die on the cross today. I'm calling court to session. It's time to rule on everybody's case this morning. I, mean, I can only imagine what it was like that day when the devil was killing Jesus on the cross and thought he had won, only to find out the next moment God called court in order. Can you imagine and he says, now I'm ready to rule. Now I'm ready to rule on everybody's behalf. Because there's a perfect lamb that doesn't roll judgment back for another year. It eradicates it and erases it off of our slate and claim. The Bible says, mm -hmm. the Bible says, if we confess our sin before the Lord, that he is faithful and just to forgive us. He says, if we repent and turn from our wicked ways, he heals our land. The Bible says that he makes us whiter than snow. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west and remembers it against us no more. That's why you can boldly go before the throne because there's no evidence in heaven, in heaven against you. It's all gone. It's all gone. The devil comes to have an accusation. He says, where's the evidence? It was here a minute ago. Yeah, sure it was, wasn't it? It's all gone. It's all gone because of the blood of Jesus. So I began to mess with this idea of repenting for other people. Now, what I'm getting ready to talk about is not public ministry. This is private ministry. This is private behind the scenes. This is work that, oh, the Lord loves this. This is work that nobody knows about. It's just between you and Papa. And that's why he loves to bless it, because it's not for you, and you'll never get credit for it. I believe that we can walk into this new modern-day priesthood and we can do some work in our congregation that causes revival to be released in another congregation, and nobody even know they're tied together. All right, so here we go. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. He still has not died on the cross. He still has not resurrected from the dead. 
This is Jesus pre-cross. He's still functioning in his humanity, but with the Holy Spirit under the eyes and ears, watching the Lord under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus on the earth says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Do you believe that God forgave them? Absolutely. There's not a doubt. Is that a question? That looks like a statement to me. Father, forgive them. Jesus wrote a check out of God's bank account in heaven. What Jesus did is he had the authority. God gave him the checkbook. All the grace was in heaven. Jesus looked up in heaven and saw the finished work of the cross, wrote a check, transferred it from that account to this account, and said, Father, forgive them in Jesus' name. Forgive them, and God the Father forgave them. Okay, you feel that? Okay. Pre-cross. Pre-cross, Jesus, as a man, forgave their sins and did not hold them accountable. Now, if I was to go to you and say, do you have the power to forgive sin? You would probably say, I have the right to forgive somebody who sins against me. Would, we, would most of us feel comfortable saying that? It's one of the great responsibilities, one of the great privileges we have. That when somebody sins against you, you have the right to say, I give up any right of of." But of um, retribution. That was bigger the word than what I was going to use, but that will work. <laughs> Punishment, retribution, getting even with somebody. Uh, so so when, when somebody sins against us, we have the right to not hold an account, not hold them as guilty, and also release ourselves from holding unforgiveness and bitterness and all that stuff. We have the right as Christians to forgive that person, right? Okay. So there's an interesting passage, an interesting story in the Old Testament. You remember David with Bathsheba and then David with Uriah? And you remember that during that season, you know, David sinned against Bathsheba and then David sinned against Uriah. But David then experiences the Lord in such a deep way that David makes this statement, against you and you alone have I sinned. David tapped into something that when you sin against somebody else, that sin is not just between the two of you. If I sin against Aaron, I not only sin against Aaron, I sin against her family, I sin against the body of Christ, and I sin against the Lord. So what David saw was he was not downplaying what he did to Uriah. He wasn't downplaying what he did with Bathsheba, but he was expressing what I've really done is I've sinned against the Lord. And it's such a big deal of what I've done to the Lord, it's like, it's like oh, it's overwhelming and overshadowing to everything else. Does that make sense? So we have personal sin, and then we have the sin against the Lord. So I'm sitting there going, God, I know you can forgive those guys because Jesus said you can forgive those guys. But wait again, and again, they didn't repent. They didn't confess their sin. They didn't ask to be forgiven, and Jesus is taking the initiative to forgive sin before they've done anything, and I'm, I'm, I'm mesmerized by this. So Jesus, who's been filled with the Holy Spirit, with his eyes and ears on the Father, is freely releasing forgiveness, knowing what's getting ready to happen. So then the question came to me is, do I have the power as a believer to forgive people of their sin? Not because they sinned against me, but because I saw them sin against you and I choose to forgive them so they're not held accountable for it. Hold on. Feel that? You feel that in the room? Hold on. Okay. Then I read this scripture. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. And now Jesus is going to meet with the 11 disciples in the upper room. So Jesus is going to walk in the room, and this is what Jesus does. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Most theologians will tell you this is when the disciples got saved. They will say that God lived external to the disciples until this moment. But at this moment, Jesus has died, resurrected from the dead, and now Jesus in his first meeting with all the disciples, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And from that time, they became believers, temples of the Holy Ghost. We feel good about that? Now Jesus has his disciples full attention, and now they are experiencing the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and what is the first assignment that God gives them. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Mm. 
just like Jesus, he fills them with the Holy Spirit, says, now train your eyes on the Father and your ears upon the Father. And as you run around running into sin, if you forgive them, they're forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Uh Uh-oh. Now we're going to tap into some stuff where the church is really messed up, okay? So I'm going to walk you through my journey. I began to experience the Lord in deep ways where he wanted me to share his love with other people. I felt his favor, his blessing. Like Job, I realized I am a friend of God, but there are others who are not friends of God that God wants me to extend that same grace and favor to. Then he begins to teach me about Chief Repenter. And he begins to show me how the high priest on the Day of Atonement would repent for his sins, his family's sins, and the nation's sins. Then he shows me Job chapter 1, where Job makes sacrifices on behalf of his kids. Then he shows me Ezra chapter 9, where Ezra repents of the sins of the nation. Nehemiah chapter 1, when Nehemiah finds out the wall has been torn down, and Nehemiah repents for the sins of a nation. Or Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel reads about the judgment of God in the scroll of Jeremiah after 70 years, and he over a dozen times, he says, we have sinned against you, God, and he repents for the sins of the nation. And I begin to realize and understand that one of the jobs of the priest is to represent people to God, and therefore, I need to start confessing the sins that I see with other people. And one of the ways we do that, I've I've heard people, you know, pray for like people in Washington, D.C., doesn't matter which party. Lord, they're all stupid. They're they're all, Lord, just help them, God. God, help them. They they won't listen. They won't, I mean, and I'll get done with the prayer going, please don't ever pray for me. Please, that was like the yuckiest, I feel defiled. I mean, please don't pray for me if that's the way you pray. The way you confess sin with somebody, see, here's the thing about the Old Testament priest, is he knew his frailty. He knew his proclivity for sin. And so when I repent for somebody, if I see somebody in sin, I just, in the spirit, I just grab them by the hand and say, Father, we've sinned. Man, we've messed up. We've not humbled ourselves before you. God, I stand there in my humanity with their humanity. And I said, God, I'm repenting on their, I don't even have to tell them I'm repenting. I, I, that's not my job. So, so, so my, what I do is, I do two things. I stand there and say, Father, we repent of our sin right now. I know they're not in the room, but I'm in the room. I'm Job, I'm a friend of God, and they're in my hands right now. I repent. And then I turn and I say, and you're forgiven in Jesus' name. Now, pause it for a moment. So, I'm watch, if I, I have some pastor friends that disagree with me. And from time to time, I'll take them to lunch or something to pick their brain on how badly they disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the arguments they have against me so I can come up with better arguments for my case. Than, or maybe they're right and i got to change my mind. I'm open to that too, right? right? So, so if I was to go, now I want you to listen. I'm going to push on you, all right? I'm, I'll, I dare you to go pray about this and go get in the Word of God for yourself. That's what I want you to do, all right? That's what, I don't want you to agree with me. I want you to go find the heart of the Father for yourself. So here, if I went to some of my pastor friends that disagree with me, if I was to ask them this question, what would you do, what's the right godly ministerial thing to do if you see somebody in your congregation in sin? What should you do? I have pastor friends that will say, you should go to them, and you should open the book, and you should tell them how messed up they are and how bad that sin is. Then you should hit them over the head with this Bible, and you should tell them to repent. And if they will not repent, you should disassociate with them people and not let them be around you any longer. I'm telling you there are people that believe that that's their responsibility and their duty. And I'm telling you, I think that's more ungodly than what I'm preaching this morning. I think I should, I think I should get, I, first of all, I don't think I should go to them because the only person who can change the sin in your life is the Holy Spirit convicting you of the sin and giving you the grace to change. He's the only one that can do that. I'm not big enough to know your sin and give you the ability to change. I'm not, I'm not capable of doing it. What I can do for you is I can recognize it, not judge you, grab you by the hand in the spirit, stand before Papa and repent with you and ask for God's mercy for your life. To me, that looks a lot more godly than the other approach, in my opinion. So I started doing some study and stuff. And I was listening to a sermon, probably one of the greatest sermons of all time, 10 shekels in a shirt, Paris Reed head, just like melt your face off. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those sermons when you get done with it, you know, we just gotta go repent for eating food yesterday. I mean, it's just like intense. 
And, and he mentions a guy in there, he mentions in a sermon a guy named John Wesley Redfield. John Wesley, not John Wesley, John Wesley Redfield. And John Wesley Redfield was around in the mid-1800s, and he was revivalist. He's a holiness Methodist pastor. He's a holiness movement Methodist pastor, John Wesley Redfield. Uh, one of the quotes he has is he was invited to come do a revival. You'll like this, Chip. He came to do a revival in, uh, at a church, and they said, hey, Pastor John Wesley Redfield's here. He's going to be doing a three-night revival. He'll be here for the next three nights, so let's welcome him up here. And John Wesley Redfield gets up there, and he says, I don't know that I'm going to be here for three nights because I've come to preach to you the gospel. And the gospel has the power to change your life. It's the only message that can change your life. And I refuse to water down the only message that could change your life. You may not invite me back tomorrow night. I mean, <laughs> so here's what happened. John Wesley Redfield ends up in New Haven, Connecticut. He's a holiness guy. And as he's preaching this revival in this church, he becomes aware of the sin of the people in the congregation. And he tries to communicate how bad that is before the Lord and how they should be on their faces before God. He's trying to explain, but they just can't see what he sees through his holiness lens. And he gets so mad while he's preaching, he finally just says, if you will not repent for your sins, John Wesley Redfield will repent for you. And he begins repenting for sins. People start getting nervous and take off running out the back of the church. The Holy Spirit begins knocking them out in the streets as they're trying to get away. True story. You go, go look. It knocks them out in the streets. The police in New Haven start finding people laying around on the side of the road. They do this. They go up and smell their breath to see if it smells like alcohol. If it is, they arrest them for public drunkenness. If they smell their breath and it doesn't have alcohol, they pull them out of the road and set them under a tree because there's nothing you can do but wait for them to come to. But when they come to, if they were a thief, they're not a thief anymore. If they were a drunk, they're not drunk anymore. If they are lost, they're not saved. They're changed. What happened is God treated them as if they had repented because John Wesley Redfield repented for them. Wow. Can you imagine if we, because when you do it for somebody else, it counts more than when you do it for yourself. It moves, Papa, when we take the grace that we have, the favor we have, and we extend it to somebody else. Can you imagine? And so, so listen, literally, it's called Redfield disease. Look it up. Redfield disease is when John Wesley Redfield repents you into a stupor. <laughs> he repents you into unconsciousness. He changes your life because God responds to that. So, so then we have this other piece. So the job of the Old Testament priest was to say, this is common, this is holy. You're infectious and... You be with the crowd, or now you're, you're healed, and, and you're clean, and there's no problem. You're innocent, or you're guilty. That was the job of the Levitical priest. I'm convinced we're still on the job. I'm convinced that God has called modern-day priests all around this room, and he allows you to see sin and brokenness, and he allows you to decide whether they're forgiven or whether they should be judged. We'll talk about this next week. We have loosed a ton of judgment on ourselves because the church has become so, so judgmental. Now listen, I want to say this. I've said it once before, and this is powerful. If God ever lets you see sin or dysfunction in somebody else, it's because you have a part of their healing. God is not a gossip. God is not a gossip. He does not let you see other people's sin to embarrass them, to shame them, or to make you feel better about your problems. God will only bring you into other people's sin because somebody needs to repent. Somebody needs to stand up and go before the Father. Somebody needs to make a sacrifice. Somebody needs to forgive that sin. That's why you're in the game. That's why he's got you in their life, to be a modern-day priest. So I began looking at this passage. I said, Jesus, as the Son of Man, forgave this man of his sins. Wow. 
can I, as a Christian, forgive somebody of their sin? I'm not God. I'm the son of God. But I'm the son of God that's the royal priesthood on the earth today. Now, I'm gonna, this, this is going to be fun. This is going to be so much fun. I'm only doing what Jesus would do. So what I'll do is I will hold somebody in the spirit, hold my hand and say, God, Father, we repent right now for our wickedness. We have not done well. Father, forgive us in Jesus' name. You are forgiven in Jesus' name. That sin is not held against you. Now, do, can I forgive all the sins of all mankind? No, Jesus didn't even do that. Jesus paid the price, but you have to decide whether or not you will receive his forgiveness. I am not saying I can forgive somebody's sin and they are eternally saved in the heart of God. I am not saying that at all. What I'm saying, now listen very clearly because I think you'll get it if I say it like this. Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also. One of the works Jesus did is look at sin and choose to forgive it. Now, I'm on this side of the cross, and Jesus already died for their sin 2,000 years ago and already predetermined to forgive them if they'll ask. So as this side of the cross, as a priest, I have the right to expect God will forgive me. You already paid the price. Somebody just has to release that forgiveness. So I, I'm, not, I'm not quite, I can't, uh, there's this old covenant, new covenant. I can't say for sure 100% that if somebody sins against you and I see it, that I forgive them, that that sin is forgiven forever. But I can tell you this is what I do believe. Old Testament, they would repent of the sin and judgment was delayed a year. What if we see sin and if we forgive the sin, it just buys them grace and time for them to come to repentance before the Lord? What, what, what if we're the clock? What if we're the ones that dictate when judgment comes? What if we're the ones that see it and say, no, God, not, no judgment now. God, we forgive them in Jesus' name. We release your forgiveness. And what if God says, good, I'll just roll back the clock until they can come to their senses? I, they still have to come to their senses for them to be saved. But what if judgment is delayed because the modern-day priesthood takes their place, stands between God and man, and cries out to God for mercy and releases mercy back to that person? I think that's my job. Some of you in this room, you have grandchildren that are not walking with the Lord. You have grandchildren that are not in church this morning. You've asked them a hundred times to come to church. They won't come to church. They've not been in church. And they're sitting out there, and they have no hope because their hope is Jesus Christ, and they don't want to hear about Jesus. What if we stopped inviting them to church? Not that that's a bad thing. We should invite people to church. But what if we started going before the Lord as a modern-day priest? And take them by the hand and say, Papa, you are the Lord of the universe. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are the perfect lamb that's taken. With our mouth, we acknowledge that you are the name above every other name. And we begin doing that together and confessing our sins and crying out to God. And then turn with the Father heart of God, looking through the cross where he had already predetermined forgiveness, said, in Jesus' name, you're forgiven. And what if that turns the clock of judgment back and gives them grace to find their own repentance, to bow their own knee, to use their own mouth to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of their life? What you will not get past, I don't know where you're going to end up on the end of this sermon. I don't know what your, your final thoughts are going to be. But I will say this to you. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, before the cross forgave people of their sins. As the Son of Man on the earth, Jesus then breathes the Holy Spirit on his disciples, and the next word out of his mouth is, if you forgive them, they're forgiven. I'm concerned that the church has tried to be the police officers of our world, and we have saw, seen people in their sin and dysfunction and said, have you, this convicted me first service. Have you ever seen somebody do something mean, and you say, somebody needs to jerk a knot in that person? They're going to get what they deserve. Did we just release judgment? Did, 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 did we, the, 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 the ministers of the covenant of grace, we're the covenant of the New Testament, the covenant of grace. We didn't get what we deserve. And maybe God put us in that place to, 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 to hijack that moment to say, no, God, not judgment today, mercy today, mercy today. 
And I'm going to talk about that next week. How do we repent with one another? How do, we, how do we stall judgment? How have we brought judgment on our own lives? How do we pray for our enemies? Those are some of the things we're going to talk about. This was actually supposed to be the fourth sermon of the series, but I got concerned that we might have some cleanup work, so I put it in the third week. So next week, if we need to clean anything up, we, we can. But I always say Jesus dealt with sin globally because of his sacrifice. I can't do that. I'm not God. I'm the Son of God. Jesus dealt with sin specifically when it was brought into his attention. I believe as modern day priests, we have the right to deal with individual sin directed at us or someone else. As it comes our way, we have the right to repent and forgive it and then by grace for those people to come into repentance on their own. And I'm overwhelmed at how much judgment I have released on this world. I am overwhelmed at how much I've seen and in that moment, Judge them as not worthy, deserving punishment, and I wonder how much I've released and how much I have reaped in my life because I have been harsh with the gospel of grace. The modern day priesthood is three things. It is you finding the favor of the Lord through your private devotions with the Lord, where you are so filled with his goodness that you can't keep it all to yourself, and he begins to put burdens on your heart for other people, and you say, yes, I'll share that with them. Number two, it is recognizing sin, grabbing that person's spirit, not calling them, not talking to them, not calling them out, not even approaching them, but standing for Papa with them in our hand and saying, God, we have sinned, and confessing our sins before the Lord. And then number three, turning as God's priest and say, you are forgiven in Jesus' name through the blood of the Lamb, the perfect blood of Jesus, and letting Papa roll back judgment until they can find their own knee and their own voice that's what I believe the modern-day priesthood is. It's not a public ministry. It's a private ministry. The results can't be tied back to you. You can never take credit for this ministry. It is private work that pops up with results all over the place that can never be traced back to you because it is birthed in heaven, it is for heaven, and it stays in heaven. But I believe it has power. Can you imagine if we started repenting, people start getting knocked out? Can you remember we start forgiving people and then they start get saved because they were forgiven first by the predetermined gift of Jesus on the cross and we came into agreement with heaven. Everything's established in the mouth of two or more witnesses. His, his yes and his amen. We are the earthly agent that agree, excuse me, agrees with heaven on their behalf. Chew on it. Chew on it. I believe I've been put in some bad circumstances, and I thought I was there to clean them up. I was not there to clean them up. I was there to sit on my knees before the Lord and beg for mercy. I was there to sow mercy for my own life, sow mercy for their life. I was to represent them to God, and unfortunately, they did not get God's best. But in the last year and a half, I've been working on this sermon. I've been sitting with the Lord. I've been recognizing sin. I've been repenting of that sin on behalf of myself and other people. I've been pronouncing them innocent. And I'm telling you, God is moving. Now, you put a corporate group of ministers together like that, and it'll shake a region. It'll shake a region. And we'll become more aware of our own sin, walk in more holiness and more purity. Everybody wins. Amen? Father, we humble ourselves, and, and, and right now I just want to take a moment to repent and just say, Father, we repent of the judgment we have released in this world. Father, you have made us priests of your covenant. You've taught us your way. You've taught us your will. And, Lord, we've noticed other people not walking in that. And instead of sowing mercy and doing what Jesus would do, loving arms wide open, we, choose, we chose to condemn them, criticize them. We repent of a critical spirit, being judgmental of pride and arrogance. We repent of that, God. But, Father, your word says if we repent, you are faithful and just to forgive us. So right now, we accept your forgiveness. We move this sin for as far as the east is from the west. Remember it against us no more. And I'm asking, God, that we would walk with more purity, more kindness, more grace than we ever had before. Now, Father, I ask this week for assignments. I ask, God, that you would show us people that need someone to stand in their place and call upon heaven for repentance, for kindness, for mercy. Lord, I'm asking that you give us assignments. And, Father, for those who we see in sin, that we could forgive them and, and just pre-announce grace over their life until they can repent for themselves. Father, I ask that we would find our role as modern-day priests and that we would stand together 
to deal with this issue called sin, and their only solution to sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand in the middle, God, as your ministers and come into agreement. We only do the works that Jesus did because he told us we were to do those works. He forgave sins. We forgive sins. We thank you for what you're doing in the heavenlies, in the spirit realm this morning, even in this sermon. We accept our assignments in Jesus' name. Amen.